probably final episode on the whole conversation on in for good and the question that we're proposing for this morning's conversation is the whole thing of okay so we're in for good but in for who's good um, <laughs> yeah some i read a line from uh, richard blackaby good great pastoral counselor who at one stage said you know you, you really need to set boundaries on people who who are demanding your time and energy and he says sometimes you get to the point where you feel fixing you is killing me kind of thing you know so maybe if we ask the question in for who's good who's fixing who and who's killing who <laughs> Uh, eventually, I think when we understand what God intended, when He set things up to work the way He designed them to work, it would work out for everybody's good. And when I'm focused on doing what He considers to be good for His good, I am the one who reaps the benefit. It happens to work out for my good, and eventually it works out for the good of those around me. That's the way God has set things up to work. That's the way His goodness cascades into this world. We cannot separate the concept of good from the person of God. Uh, I love the way the old English, uh, Anglo-Saxon word good, G-O-D, was spelt. That was it. The word good, G-O-D, and the word God, G-O-D, was spelt the same. The only way you could differentiate between whether this is good or God is if there's a capital G in front of the word. If it's the capital, it's got to do with the person, God. But if there's no capital G, then it's got to do with the nature, the character, the goodness, the, the, the character of the thing that you're talking about. So good and God cannot be separated from each other. Once they do, you have a reference for what is good that is not godly. Or you have a reference for God that is not good. I think what we've done in our society today is that we've separated things that should never have been separated from each other. Like, for example, separating what is good from who God is. Thinking that certain things, because I believe they're good, will work out good for me. Like the prodigal son who decided it's not good for me to stay in this house. It's going to be better for me to leave this place and go and do what I know I can and shouldn't want to do. Uh, we'll go to that conversation in a moment. You know where that ended up, don't you? But things that have been separated from each other, unfortunately, have left us with misunderstandings of how things work. Let me give you one example. And this one changed the way I see reality. Genuinely. It changed the way I see reality. When I realized that the word authority, the way we get to use it nowadays, has gravitated towards an understanding of um, the right to do what I believe is right to do. I have the authority to do it. I am mandated to do what I believe is right. Authority has gravitated to that particular understanding. And we have people in positions of authority who are doing what they believe is right. Uh, unfortunately, a lot of what they're doing, if they believe it's right, is not working out to be good. It may be right for them, but it's not good for everybody. So the, the understanding of authority, unfortunately, has been disconnected from its original understanding. Authority is supposed to be a Trinitarian concept. Like humanity, being human is a Trinitarian concept. We are spirit, soul, body, the entire spectrum, spiritual things, physical things, and also the psychological. As human beings, we cover the entire spectrum. There are angels who are spiritual and psychological, but they're not physical. There are animals that are physical and psychological, but they're not spiritual. Human beings are the only creatures that cover the entire spectrum. Unfortunately, I think a lot of our modern understanding of what it means to be human has gravitated away from the Trinitarian understanding of humanity more to a secular understanding of humanity. We're physical and we're psychological and that's that. We have reduced what it means to be human away from what God intended humanity to be. And so we've done with authority. 
We've reduced authority to being something that it shouldn't be. Actually, tr authority as a Trinitarian concept cannot be separated from responsibility and accountability. Authority can only be true authority if those two things come with it. When you take those two things away from it, it ceases to be truly authority. Let's take this into the arena of marriage. A young man and a young woman decide to live together. At some other stage, he begins to wonder why this woman does not listen to him. Because he wears the pants. He's the leader. He's supposed to dictate the pace, the direction, etc. And she doesn't listen to him. What he doesn't understand is that he doesn't have authority. Because he's refused to take responsibility. And he's refusing to submit to accountability. Without responsibility and accountability, you have no authority. You can manipulate. You can bully. You can <clears throat> plead. You can do what you like. But you don't have authority. When I decide to come under God's authority... When I decide to embrace accountability, when I choose to take up responsibility, I step into that place where God says, now you are representing me as a husband to this woman, your wife. And I will empower you to do what you need to do for her benefit. You're in place so that she can have the benefit of you being in place. If you're not in place, she's not going to have the benefit. I'm not going to authorize you. I'm not going to mandate you. I'm not going to empower you because you refuse to represent me. And guys, let's face it. Once we get married, that's not the end of the story, right? Because there's a variety of ways in which we need to learn how to represent him well to our wives. I know sometimes we feel, why can't they just be like men? Why can't they just think like men? Why, can't, why do we have to go through all of this? Henry Eagleton at one stage made a comment that I thought was so classic about the way women respond to men's leadership. Uh, he says, the difference between men and women primarily is that men are like a 500 watt globe. You put the switch on and he's there. Women are like 500 candles that you need to light one by one. And somewhere in the process, a wind comes along, a breeze comes along and blows half of them out. And you have to start all over again. And for men, this can be so frustrating. But strangely enough, I don't know if you realize this, but the metaphor that God uses for the church is a female one. He calls us his bride. I think on Sunday mornings, <laughs> he's like doing his best to light candles one after the other here. And Lefuno is giving it all. He's, the sparks are flying. The flames are going. And some of us are just, just don't want to be lighted. Not today, Lord. Not today. Lord, I've got a headache. Not now. And, <laughs> and he's saying, but if you just align yourself with what I want to say and do, you're going to get the benefit. It's going to be good for you to allow me to light you, to get your passion fired up for me. It's going to be good for you. The awareness of his love for us is the thing that actually brings that flame again, that passion, that fire, that restoration. That normally kicks in when we are freshly made aware of his love and his desire for us. Now, God created us good. He created us good. At the end of Genesis 1 and 2, where, well, end of Genesis 1, after he's created man in his image, you have, you have God looking back over all of this and saying, man, this is good. This is so good. And then you have Adam and Eve doing their thing and missing the point, and suddenly it's not good anymore. So now we, I think we get, we get, hoodwinked into thinking that because man is not good, he's bad. Everything about being human beings, fallen human beings, is that we are bad. No, that's not true. 
we, we're not bad. We're lost. And our lostness takes us to a place where we do bad things. And ultimately, we become so corrupt as a result of our lostness, we lose the, the goodness that God invested in us. When we get lost, normally we get lost because somewhere along the line we feel we've been hurt. Uh, we don't understand what's happening and we, and we turn our back on God. The prodigal son, he felt that the restrictions of what was happening in his home, for him, they were just too, 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 you know, he just couldn't really live himself out in this place. Genesis 2, verse 16 and 17. We have God's conversation about the tree of life, the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. He actually says to them, most of the time we pick up in Genesis 2, 17, the first command that God gave man is, thou shalt not. No, it's not. That Genesis 2, 17 is the middle of a sentence. He starts the conversation in verse 16 with, you may, you must. In fact, I want you to. I'm giving you permission. I'm authorizing you. You have the authority to eat of all the trees of the garden. Particularly, you, you realize that there are two trees in the middle of the garden, the tree of life and the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. So giving them permission to eat of all the trees, verse 16, includes the tree of life. God gave us access to the tree of life from the beginning. Verse 17, he adds, now there's one tree that's going to cause problems. Don't go there. It's not going to be good for you. Don't go there. So what did Adam and Eve do? They went there. Is it possible for good people to make bad decisions? Oh, well, Genesis 3 proves it. They were innocent. They were good people. And they made a bad decision. So making bad decisions doesn't make you bad. It makes you lost. It makes you confused. It will bring negative implications. And unless you prepare to take responsibility for the implications of your choice, God is going to struggle to work with you to make that work out for your good. In Romans 8 verse 28, he mentions, God is busy working with all of the decisions that you make and all of the things that are happening around you. He's busy working with those things to make sure that they work out out for the good if you're in in the will of God you're in for good you're in for your good you're in for the good of those around you because his goodness flows through you into their lives Ephesians 2 verse 10 is where I want to take you this morning we are his workmanship we have been, we are his own masterwork, and I'm taking this one from the Amplified, Ephesians 2.10. We are his own masterwork, a work of art in Christ Jesus. We have been reborn from above, spiritually transformed, renewed. Wait, let's just pause the conversation here. I've just been talking about people who've made bad decisions. Don't become bad people, become lost people. How do you get from being lost back to being back in the will of God? It's very easy. Acknowledge that you're not where you should be. The prodigal son, in returning home, came with a confession. He said, Father, I have sinned against heaven, and I have sinned against you. That's a great place to start. Acknowledging before God, I'm out of line here. I'm sorry, I missed it. Please forgive me. And then acknowledging to those around you that you have disrupted by your decisions, saying, I'm sorry, I got it wrong. Please forgive me. That's a great place to start. Confession, as they say, is good for the soul. So we confess that we've been out of line. We acknowledge our sin, our bad decisions. Then we believe that God's way is better than our way. And in fact, God provided for the fact that you're going to make bad decisions. He created an opportunity through Christ and what Christ did on the cross so that your bad decisions and the implications of those could be dealt with in a way that is redeeming and rather than destructive. In Christ, he took upon himself your sin, your problems that you caused. And when you engage with him and ask for his participation in restoring your life, and you come under his authority prepared to take responsibility and live with accountability, guess what happens? Suddenly, 
the decisions that you start making are aligning with His will and His heart, and you begin to live in the will of God. Now, those are the kinds of people that Paul is talking about here in Ephesians chapter 2. He's just started the first seven verses of Ephesians 2 describing who we were, what we got up to, and how that by grace we are saved through faith in Christ Jesus. We have been restored to a position of righteousness in Him. From that point on, he starts talking about who we are and how God has put us together and for what purpose. We are his workmanship, his own masterwork, a work of art created in Christ Jesus, reborn from above, spiritually transformed, renewed. Maybe I should just take you to some behind the scenes language here. I just love language and I love the way that the language of the Bible is put together. So bear with me. If I'm boring you, just put the pause button on that recording. You can come back to it in a few minutes time. The word for his workmanship, the Greek word there is the same Greek word that is foundational to our English word poem and poetry. You are his love sonnet. He has put you together, recreated you in such a way that when you move, it's poetry in motion. When you speak, it's poetry to his ears. You are his (laughs) poem. Now that connects with the Hebrew word in Genesis 2, verse 22. The concept in Genesis 1 and 2, God, God is creating stuff. And there are three Hebrew words that are used for his creating. The first one is Genesis 1 verse 1. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. The Hebrew word for that created, that's like bringing into existence stuff that never existed before. Nobody had the idea that it could ever be. He had the idea. He spoke. He brought it into existence. Creating out of nothing all that is. That's the word in Genesis 1 1. Then in Genesis 2 verse 7, when he makes Man, this is weird, it's lovely. It's like a kid playing in the mud. Clay dough, that kind of stuff. Nah? It's like God is <laughs> he's experimenting. He's you know, trying to be kind of, okay, I wonder what will happen if we do this. Or maybe that. Maybe we should try this. And you see the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit playing in the mud and putting together this thing that they call man. So, gentlemen... The, the impression that you had of yourself, <laughs> you're actually just <laughs> a glorified clump of clay. <laughs> but God comes and he breathes his breath of life into that, and man becomes a living soul. That, that Hebrew word that's used for made or create or shape, it's different to the first one in Genesis 1 verse 1. Now in Genesis 2 verse 22, you know the story where he opens up Adam's side while Adam is in a deep sleep. Some people say he never woke up, but let's not go there now. (laughs) While God is opening up Adam's side and taking out a part of what was inside of him, the Hebrew word for when he creates or shapes that rib or whatever it was into the form of a woman. That's the same Hebrew word. It's craftsmanship to the nth degree. It's ingenuity. It's incredible skill that is being exercised to bring about this creature. Ladies, I know when you read that, you understand that you, in the way you have been constructed, you are light years ahead of your husband. I mean, he's like model 0.1, and you are model 10 point whatever it may be, okay? Light years difference. And that is the word, the Hebrew word in Genesis 2.22, that this Greek word, poem, poetry, actually connects with. And when he talks about the church, the believers who have been brought together, reconstructed, reshaped in Christ, This is the word he's using. You are the most intricate thing that God could ever have dreamed of putting together. This is who you are. The goodness of who you are as a recreated being in Christ. It is unparalleled, unequaled. There is nothing like it. So why did he go to all that trouble? Well, the verse carries on and he tells you why. 
starts with we are his workmanship, his own masterwork, a word of work of art in Christ Jesus, created in Christ Jesus, reborn from above, spiritually transformed, renewed, ready to be used for good works, which God prepared for us beforehand, in which um, taking paths which he set so that we would walk in them, living the good life which he prearranged and made ready for us. This is what you were designed for. That phrase, the good life, remember I said the word good and the word God cannot be separated from each other. Anybody who's inviting you to engage in the good life that is not in alignment with the character, the nature, the purposes, the presence of God, that is not a good life. It cannot be a good life. It can only take you to destruction. But in Christ Jesus, you have been recreated in order to engage in the good life that he had and set up. He has in mind for us. Now, when I start walking in the will of God, when I embrace what he says is good for me, I begin, when I'm in for his good, it begins to work together for my good. Romans 12 is the place I want to take us now. The first part of the verse 2. Very, very, I'm taking it again from the Amplified. Very intriguing way that Paul has put this thing together. He says, don't be conformed to this age. Now that word conformed, interestingly enough, it does have connections with Genesis 2 verse 7. That whole thing of squeezing this clay into this mold, into this shape. Taking what's there and forcing it in a sense molding it into something that you would like to see. This word has connections with that concept. Strangely enough, now Paul is using it of the systems of this world. And the way the systems of this world take what is there of your life and try and squeeze it into what they consider, what your culture considers to be, this is the way the good life looks. And you get squeezed into that mold. And you are, <laughs> uh, ladies, you know, teaching your kids to bake or whatever. You, you know, you, you roll out this pan of dough or whatever. And then you start cutting away what you feel doesn't fit into this shape. You know, you know how that works. Uh, that's what our culture does to us. God has created an expansive layer of goodness that we call life. And then our culture comes and starts cutting away the stuff that they feel doesn't fit into their mold. And you are left with less than what God intended you to have if you allow that to happen. Don't be conformed, molded into a predetermined shape or pattern. But be transformed, <laughs> changing from the inside out. Listen to what Kenneth Wust, a Greek scholar, you, how he translates this part of that particular verse. He says, stop assuming an outward expression that does not come from within you and is not representative of what you are in your inner being, but is patterned after this age. Change your outward expression to one that comes from within and is representative of of your inner being. Isn't that amazing how the call upon our lives is to be sure that we're not allowing culture to dictate to us what is good. So, don't be conformed to this world or this age fashioned after or adapted to its external superficial customs, but be transformed or changed by the entire renewal of your mind, by its new ideals and attitudes, so that you may prove for yourselves what is the good and acceptable and perfect will of God, even the thing which is good and acceptable and perfect in His sight for you. Are you seeing what's happening here? When you choose to engage Him for what is good for Him, what He decides is good, it turns out to be good for me. I begin to experience it so that you may know the will of God. Um, how many of you have found yourself at a place from time to time where you say, I wish I knew the will of God 
for this situation. Am I alone? <laughs> Sounds like it's a regular occurrence. Most of us. Okay, but Romans 12 verse 1 tells us how to set ourselves up so that we can begin to experience first-hand knowledge of the will of God. It tells us, give your body a living sacrifice, fully given over to His purposes. That's the way to set yourself up, to begin to know the will of God. Then he says, don't allow this culture to tell you what is good and what is right. Embrace that which is within you, the Christ life within you. Start finding ways to let that be expressed. So that you may know experientially what is the will of God for you. And he, he mentions three words, good, perfect, and acceptable. Um, I was annoyed the other day, well, some time ago, when I read a comment on the good, perfect, and acceptable will of God, where the writer says, there are three levels to the per the getting into the will of God. Firstly, there's the good will of God. It's not bad, but it's not really what God had in mind. It's good. Then there's the acceptable will of God. Yeah, that's okay. In fact, God doesn't mind if you do that. Uh, it's obviously not quite where he wants you, but actually it, you, you, you're a lot better off there than you were otherwise. And then there's the perfect will of God. When you're doing everything spot on perfectly, it's, I mean, you're absolutely like that's where the father says to the son, this is my beloved son in whom I'm well pleased. He's doing everything right. And then I realized, but this can't be true. Because the statement that the father made over the son, this is my beloved son in whom I am well pleased, Jesus hadn't done anything up until that point. So it wasn't about achieving a 10 out of 10 so that you can live in the perfect will of God. It's got nothing to do with what you're achieving. It's got nothing to do, in a sense, with your behavior. It's got everything to do with understanding and grasping what his desires are and stepping into that. The good will of God. I want you to understand, when God says, this is what I want, this is my will, the good will of God, there's nothing negative about it. There's nothing bad about it. There's nothing destructive about it. There's nothing disruptive about it. It's quality through and through. It's good. You can embrace it with absolute conviction. It's good. The will of God is always good. The will of God is always acceptable. There's nothing in the will of God that anybody can look at and say, I'm so sorry, but that cannot apply to me. It's not acceptable. I can't accept that God would expect that of me. There's nothing in there that is not acceptable. The will of God is universally acceptable. The will of God is perfect. There are no loopholes. There are no flaws. There's nothing about the will of God that the father would probably one day sit down and say to the son, uh, we forgot something. We missed something. We should have thought of this. Do you think it's too late? Um, what, how should we go about fixing this? The will of God is perfect. There's no flaw to it. There's nothing wrong with it. You will never be able to find fault with it. At the end of time, you will discover how perfect the will of God actually is. But the invitation that you have this morning is to engage in the will of God so that you can begin to know experientially for yourself how good it is to live in the will of God, knowing and doing His will. I talked about marriage, stepping into the authority structure that God has in mind for marriage. I think dealing with money, pretty much the same. God has processes that He has put in place for stewardship. Now, one of the, one of the things that for us is difficult to comprehend is that you're actually supposed to give your money away. You're supposed to give it. That, that's kind of weird. I know how to spend money, but to give money, that's not quite, well, our culture is telling us, guys, don't give unless you can get. But that means spend, right? Or invest. God says, give. No strings attached. That's part of what being a steward is all about. Where did it come from? Oh, I worked for it. I earned it. No, no, no. Where did it come from? He is the source of your provision. 
So if it comes from him, maybe then we should allow him to tell us what he thinks we should do with it. Um, if it doesn't come from him, then I don't want it. I don't want it because then it comes from somewhere else and I'm in trouble taking hold of it and wanting to use it. But if it comes from him, then let's give him the opportunity to tell us what he thinks we should be doing with it. Let's walk in his will when it comes to stewardship. Every day, we're challenged with so much need, and we begin to wonder, Lord, what is your will for this or that or the other? He has, he has ways and means of addressing needs, even your needs. There are times when you're wondering, God, how are we going to fix this? He's got a plan. And part of his plan is that somebody is going to be giving so that what you need is going to be made possible. That's the way he set things up to work. When I engage for his good, I find myself in the middle of what is good for me. But let's go beyond that lastly to Philippians 2 verse 13. God takes me just the way I am. And I love the way Alan has taken that conversation. He says, yes, God loves you just the way you are. But he loves you too much to leave you the way you are. In fact, he takes you just the way you are, but then he begins to shape you the way he is so that you can begin to engage with his goodness and his goodness can find expression through your being good. So, let's land with Philippians 2 verse 13 then. It's not your strength, and this is what uh, Tristan mentioned in the, well, he went to Ephesians 2, sorry, not Philippians 2. Philippians 2, for it's not your strength, but it is God who is effectively at work in you, both to will and to work. That is strengthening or energizing and creating in you the longing and the ability to fulfill your purpose for his good pleasure. I love the way the Scottish missionary Eric Little interpreted this verse. He, says, he said at one stage, I know that God has created me or made me or called me for the mission field in China. But he also made me fast. And when I run, I feel his pleasure. How many of you know that God has made you in certain ways and when you do that you don't only feel good about yourself you feel his pleasure how many of you have tapped into that experience most of us all of us should in fact and if we haven't i was in conversation this week with a student a music student who was plagued by this understanding of i i must be careful not to become too good, because if I become too good, I will become too popular, and I will become too important. And then people will not see Christ, they will see me and my talent. And I'm saying to her, no. No. That's not the way God designed us to work. Okay, if, if it was like, you know, if it was that way, let's, let's take this thing to its logical conclusion. We come to church on a Sunday. So what we do is we put our worst people up here. And we ask those who are musically not quite there and who don't really have the talent to sing in tune, and let's put them up there so that through their weakness, his power can be made known. Huh? Like, okay, so what happens? Half of the guys in this house feel, I don't want to come back to this church. It's, 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 it's difficult to worship. And then what we do, like every third or fourth Sunday, we put our worst preacher up on the pulpit. Like, like hey, <laughs> this Sunday. Like, okay, but then we say to the preacher, and we say to him, please, please, don't preach too well. Don't, don't, don't inspire them too much. You know, just, you know, just share a bit of stuff here and there. Let them, you know. And then, you know, eventually we get to the point where we realize, but actually the more we speak, uh, the more people look at us. And the more people... You miss God. So maybe we shouldn't really speak. So maybe what we should do is we should like put the notes up on the screen and we should say to the people, now it's time for the word and leave them to read the sermon notes. 
And at the end of the sermon, when they've finished reading, they can say, God, thank you, Lord. Thank you for your work. Thank you for inspiring me. Thank you. And then they can walk out and say, great sermon, great sermon. And nobody's gotten in the way. That's not the way things work. When we engage with the creator of the heavens and earth, we create with the <laughs> most how should we say, um, the most humble and yet the most capable of creative beings that you could ever find. When God shows off, when we look at what he does and we are overawed and impressed to the nth degree because he's showing what he can do, what does it do to us? Does it take us to the place where we say, ah, show off? No, it doesn't. It takes us to the place where we're inspired and we want to get to know Him better. It changes the way we approach life. So when He engages with your life, He wants to take it to a place where it inspires people around you. Where people look at you and say, how do you get that right? Wow, I'm so impressed with the way you do this or that or the other. So what do we do then? Oh, yeah. <clears throat> no. <laughs> Philippians 2.13. Guess what? I wouldn't be able to do this if I wasn't engaging with God. If his life was not making it possible. Now, we don't have to say it in so many words. Sometimes we can. Sometimes we get the opportunity to do that. But the fact that they're seeing something of who God is and how God works through our lives draws them, firstly, to us in relationship, and secondly, through us, to him. So when I'm in for his good, man, it works out for my good. And through his goodness being revealed and at work in me, his people around me begin to experience the goodness of God. Now, part of this, and, and let me land with this invitation. In for those of you who are regularly in services where I preach, you are surprised now that I'm ready to finish. Normally, I have another 20 minutes to go. Um, so you're getting ready for the next round. And no, I'm not going the next round. I'm, I'm, I'm genuinely going to land it here with this invitation. <laughs> Part of being local church is that the goodness of God in us and through us gets to impact other people's lives. And the most ideal process for that is the small group process. And last week, Tops took us into a whole thing of being engaged in the will of God for the good of others, particularly relationally and in small groups. So this week, Wednesday evening, what we have is an opportunity for you to come and hear what it's going to be like if you were to take responsibility to start a small group. Or maybe you have a small group and you feel... This is going nowhere. Or, man, I'm ready to leave this thing alone. Um, or, I want to give it over to someone else. Why don't you join us on Wednesday evening? Join us in this conversation of how God can use you to impact the lives of those around you. And it doesn't have to be a small group that you start, the Doxadeo Park View small group fellowship kind of thing. It could be a small group that you want to run at work. Or maybe, ladies, you have like two kids that are coming out of the same school like a half an hour apart from each other. And in that half hour, there's a bunch of ladies sitting and chin wagging and do that and whatever. And you decide, man, why don't we use that half hour for something more constructive? Let's start a small group in the car park. Uh, Wednesday coming, Wednesday evening. We want to invite you into that conversation. How God, His goodness through you can impact the lives of those around you for good. Okay. Clinton is the man to speak to. He's our point man for small groups at the moment. So Clinton will be out, of, out there in the foyer at the small groups board. I think there's a board there or at least place where you can sign up and say, hey, I want to be in on this conversation. Lastly, um, it's too early for you to go and get your kids. So please don't go there. Um, <laughs> Louis, are you landing the morning out of this? Okay. And you have a bunch of stuff that you want to share with us. So let me pray and wrap everything up and then set you up to land the morning. Is that okay? All right. Let's bow our heads together then as we pray. Okay. Father, you've been so gracious to us. You have invested in us so much of yourself, so much of what is good 
is found in our hearts, our lives, our minds, our talents, our abilities, and the opportunities we get to use them. I'm praying for this congregation and the people in this congregation that this week would literally become for them a red letter week where they see how your goodness in them, through them, impacts their world for good. Because when we're in for your good, it works for our good and the good of those around us. We thank you for this in Jesus' name. Amen.